All right, if you take your Bibles and turn with me, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture today, actually probably quite a few, but the two main passages I want to look at start in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, a passage that you're probably very familiar with. And then once you find that, just flip over a few pages and find 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that last week, uh, we've kind of been working our way through the book of 2 Chronicles. And today, I, I'm actually going to try to tie up all of the rest of Chronicles and finish this series up this morning. But you'll remember last week, we looked at a series of, of the different kings. We'll call them the bad kings. Um, when Israel and Judah split into two parts, uh, the northern kingdom, Israel, never had a good king after, after Solomon. They, they, the, uh, he was the last of the really good kings. But in Judah, there's sort of a mixed bag. There's some of the kings that were, were rather bad and, and, and did a lot of terrible things. We looked at those last week. Today, I want to look at some of the good kings, and I want to talk about revival. I'm going to call these the revival kings. These are the kings that, that for one reason or the other, as we're going to see today, called the people of Judah back to their relationship with God. And they teach us something important. Our relationship with God is very, very dynamic. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's always changing, in other words. We're never at the same place very long in our spiritual life. In fact, let me say this to you. There is no standing still in the spiritual life. You're either going forward or you're going backwards, all right? Uh, there might be a short moment where you're not doing one of those, but you're headed one direction or the other. You're either moving closer to Jesus or you're moving further away from him. And basically, when we're moving closer to him, that's what we're talking about when we think about revival. The first passage I want to call your attention to is in 2 Chronicles 7.14. And you'll excuse me if every once in a while I have to stop and catch my breath. It's because I'm preaching faster than my lungs can process it here this morning sometimes. But uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we'll actually start in verse 13. This is when Solomon is dedicating the temple and God comes to him and speaks to him. And listen to what he says. We'll actually go back all the way to verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Now you notice what God says there. There are going to be moments when trouble is going to come. And in those moments when trouble came to the nation of Judah, they were to take that as a message that God was trying to get their attention. He said, in those moments, listen to what happens, needs to happen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, if you go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 15, we go down and we jump ahead quite a, almost a century and we, we look at a, another king. And I want you to notice what God says to Asa, the king, beginning in 2 Chronicles chapter 15. We'll read the first two verses. The spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. These two passages are very important. In our first text this morning, when Solomon is, is there and he's dedicating the temple to the Lord, God made a promise to the nation. Implicit in this promise is the understanding that God's people live with him in a personal, intimate, and dynamic relationship. It's personal because remember what he said, if my people. This was not written to the world in general. This was not written to the people outside of the people of God. This was written to the people of God. This was written to the nation of Judah. He says, if my people, he calls them his people, my people. There's a personal relationship there. Uh, that's expressed in the New Testament in a very different way, 
and maybe even a more profound way. In the New Testament, we are taught when we approach God in prayer to pray, our Father. That's a term of intimacy. In fact, Jesus even uses the term Abba, Father, which is an even more sort of a, a personal and, and, and a informal kind of way. Now, the Jewish people wouldn't have referred to God that way. When they prayed, they, they used very formal titles for him. And this is a reminder to us of something, that our relationship with Jesus is to be very personal and very, very intimate it is to be a relationship between a child and a father. It is, we are called, the Bible says, by his name. If my people who are called by my name. There was nothing that you could think of to be more intimate in the, in the Old Testament than to share someone's name. You were sharing something about their character and, 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 and God was saying to them, uh, you are important to me. This is a very personal and intimate relationship. But it's also a dynamic relationship. He makes it very clear, not only in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that there will be moments when the people get away from God. Do we all know that? There are moments in our life when we've been walking close to God, and there are moments when we're not so close to God. Uh, on a daily basis, you know, uh, uh, let, let, me, let me tell you something. My prayer life went up a whole lot here a couple of days ago. I went over to the doctor, and I thought I had a little touch of bronchitis, and I just had an annoying cold. He says, your chest x-ray shows you had pneumonia. Well, I've never had pneumonia before. Actually, I'll be honest with you, I've been hardly sick most of the time in my life. And then and, and my prayer life got a lot better from there. Because he started talking about, well, you know, we could probably treat this for the next few days if it gets better. If not, you might have to end up in the hospital with it. Well, I don't want to go to the hospital. You get what I'm saying? So right away, my prayer life got real close to Jesus really, really fast. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you're in the midst of a crisis, very often. But then sometimes we'll drift away. We have a dynamic relationship. That's why in, in the second passage that we looked at this morning, we, we noticed that, that he says to Asa, if you are with me and you're near me, then I'll be near you. And what he's telling about is, listen, our relationship with God, in the initial phases of our relationship with God, God pursues us in our salvation. Amen? Isn't it good that he pursues us in our salvation and he takes the initiative to reach out and to save us? But while we're, as we're believers, while he continues to do that, when our relationship with Jesus has slipped away, it's not because he moved it's not because he moved. I heard a story one time. This is kind of a silly preacher joke, but I heard a story one time about an old couple, and they were driving down the road, and, uh, and Clem and Maud, and, and Clem looked at old Maud, and he said, Maud, I can remember a time when you used to sit uh, real close to me uh, when we were driving along, and you'd hold my hand, and, and he said to her, I haven't moved in other words, she's the one who had kind of slid off to the side and had not been as close to him. That's the way it is in our relationship with God. Now, what I want to look at this morning is how that dynamic relationship ebbs and flows throughout the life of Judah. As I said last week, there are some good kings, the bad kings, there are some good kings. I want to look at a few principles that we can learn from these good kings about how to have personal revival. Can we just stop in a moment and just admit something for a moment? We desperately in our personal lives and in our life as a church need revival. Can we all agree with that? We desperate. Now here's the problem I think that's happened in the church for a long time. We would love, when we think revival, we think about it wrong. We think about it from a national perspective first. Like America needs revival. In fact, let me say this to you frankly. That is absolutely true. Our nation needs revival. All right? We've been looking for revival in the wrong places. We thought revival would come because of who sits in the White House or who sits in Congress. That doesn't bring revival. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that. 
Revival starts with God's people. Revival starts with you and me. If, if, if I don't experience revival and you don't experience revival, then our church doesn't experience revival. And if our church doesn't experience revival, our community doesn't experience revival. And if our community doesn't experience revival, then our state and our nation and we go on out. It all starts with us. And so I want to show you three important principles here today that we need to deal with when it comes to experiencing or a personal revival in our life. Number one, we've got to tear down any idols in our life. I want you to notice what happens here. Look at in, in chapter 14 of 2 Chronicles. I'm just going to show you a couple quick examples of each of these. I'll point you to some scriptures. You can write them down and, and look at them later. But, but Asa now has become king. And look, look what happens in the first verse of 2 Chronicles 14. Abijah slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In, the, in his days, the land rested for 10 years. And look what it says. And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the ashram. And he commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, to keep the law and, and the commandments. If you flip over to, to chapter 17, look at what happened when Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is a, another one of the, of the revival kings. And, and notice what he did in verse 1. Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. He placed forces in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim that Asa, his father, had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father, David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and according to the practice of Israel. Now, if you were to go on, you'd find the same thing happens later on with King Josiah in chapter 23. The same thing happens later on over in the later chapters with Hezekiah. Hezekiah is one of the greatest kings of Israel. And one of the first things that he has to do is go in and clean up the temple. And, and, uh, and he has to cleanse the temple. And when you read that, you kind of think, well, he was going in, they were doing a little building project, they were going to add on, they were going to clean up, remodel, re redo, you know, th some things. But you find, if you study that very carefully, what had happened was the people had gotten so corrupt, they were bringing their idols into the temple. And what he's doing is cleaning up the worship of Israel. Now, why does he have to do that? Well, because idolatry is a constant problem in our lives. I like the way Tim Keller described uh, idols. He says, what is an idol? It is, any, if any, it is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give what only God can give. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. That's a profound statement. If you're looking to anything other than God to satisfy your life, that thing becomes an idol in your life. In other words, you've got to understand this. You are created in the image of God. And he has made you for the purpose of living in an intimate, dynamic, personal relationship with him. And you will never find any satisfaction outside of that. You can make as much money as you want. You can achieve all the worldly success that you want. You can be, um, you know, uh, the, the, the highest executive in the biggest corporation in the world. And it still won't satisfy your heart the way a relationship with Christ will. And if you're a believer and you start looking for your satisfaction anywhere other than Jesus, you are beginning to drift into idolatry. There are, I heard it described this way sometimes. There are a lot of things in our life that make good rooms for our house. If you think of the spiritual life like a house, there are a lot of things that make good rooms, but only one thing that makes a good foundation. 
Jesus has to be the foundation. If anything else is, if you think, well, you know what? My life would really be happy and satisfied if I just got the right girl. My goodness, if I could, if I could get the homecoming queen to fall in love with me. So she's here today and I just embarrassed her. If I could just find, if I could find that one guy that, print, that, that, that is just, and he would satisfy my life. Can I say to you, that becomes your idol. What are you looking for? Can I tell you this? A lot of times in the church, we make nostalgia an idol. We make tradition an idol. We make our preferences an idol. And the reality of it is, if we're going to experience revival, we got to tear all that down. We got to get back to saying, the only thing that I really desire in my life is a relationship with Jesus Christ. We were talking in our Sunday school class for a few moments this morning, talking about addictions. And I was thinking about when I was driving over, addiction is kind of an idol, isn't it? You're, you're looking at, and you're looking at something, there's all kinds of addictions, you have a drug addiction, a gambling addiction. You can have a, a sex addiction. You can have a, a, you know, a work addiction. You can have all kinds of addictions. But an addiction basically at its root is saying, this thing will satisfy me more than God. And I need it more than anything else. That's the root of all sin. Go back to Genesis chapter 3 and what do you find? God is in a personal, intimate, dynamic relationship with Adam and Eve, right? He has created them in his image. It, he has put them in a perfect world. He has given them permission to enjoy everything in that world except one thing. Last night, Max, you are off, Matt, you are off the hook. Matt said if I didn't use this illustration this morning, he would buy lunch. You're off the hook. <laughs> Max walked through our, Max is my one and a half year old grandson. All right. He walked through our kitchen. He looked up on the uh, uh, thing there on the counter and he saw cupcakes. Now it's about eight o'clock at night. And Mac, we, we, are, we are experiencing tired Max at that moment. And if you've ever been around tired Max, whoo. He can be a handful. He saw that cupcake. And that's the only thing in the world he wanted was a cupcake. And his mean, cruel parents said no. All right? And Max did everything he could. It was hilarious. He would come in there and he, would, he always sucks two fingers. And he'd come in and he'd suck his two fingers. And he'd walk up to me and he'd hold out his hand. And then if I got his hand, he'd pull me towards the thing. He went over to Katie Hannon and he kissed her and he hugged her. And then he pulled her towards the thing. Every prince of persuasion that he could, thinking that's the only thing in life that will satisfy. And here's what happened. He wouldn't be dissuaded. Well, he didn't get a cupcake, by the way. But that's the way we are, are we not? We'll get fixated on something. Well, think it's the only thing in my life that can satisfy me. That, that is the essence of what leads us into sin. And what ends up happening is Adam and Eve replace God with an idol and they fall into sin. We need to cast out and tear down every idols in, in our life. We think of idolatry as just being something they do somewhere, somewhere else. That's when they build statues and they bow down to them. But an idol can be anything in your life. It can be a relationship. It can be a job. It can be money. It can be anything that you put before God. Second thing, if we're going to have personal revival, we have to set our heart on obeying the Lord. You'll notice something here. Revival meant in the Old Testament, they didn't just turn away from something. They also turned to someone else. It's not enough just to turn away from an idol in your life. God doesn't want us just to stop worshiping false things. He wants us to worship him. 
And part of worship and the essence of worship is serving him. We have to set our hearts on obeying his commandments. So if you go back to chapter 14 for a moment, just look how this works out in scripture for a moment. Asa here in chapter 14 is calling the people back to the Lord. And notice what it says uh, that he did there. Um, it, it says that he also took uh, out all of the cities of Judah, the high places and the incense altars, and the kingdom had rest them him. He goes down and he talks about how he had built uh, all of these, um, you know, uh, fortresses. In chapter 15, it says, the spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And look what happens in verse 8. As soon as Asa heard these words, the prophecy of Azariah, the son of Obed, he took courage and put away the detestable idols. Now listen to what happens here. God sent a prophet. In the Old Testament, a lot of the ways that God spoke was not just through his word, but remember the Bible hadn't been completed yet. So he would send a prophet and the prophet would speak the word of God. When Asa hears the word of God, what does he do? He sets up out to obey it and put it into practice. Um, you see the same thing in, 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 uh, throughout the rest of this. Jehoshaphat does that in chapter 18. Um, and I, we won't read all of it this morning, but if you go over to chapter 18, Jehoshaphat hears the word of God. In chapter 24, Josiah begins to read the book of the law that had been lost, and all of a sudden it's been discovered again, and he begins to read it. And you know what they do? They don't just hear the word, they put it into practice. This is an important test of whether or not your heart is set on obeying the Lord is how much time you're spending in the week doing things like this, reading your Bible. I, people think I'm crazy about this, but people come say, hey, pastor, how can I grow spiritually? You want to grow, spir grow spiritually? Let, let, let me give you the first step, okay? And if you get this step down, the rest of them will be so easy. It'll be amazing to you. You ready? I want you to get a pen out, write this down. Read your Bible. Don't read books about the Bible. No, I, you can read books about the Bible. I read books about the Bible all the time. I read commentaries and dictionaries and all kinds of helps to help me understand the Bible better. But can I tell you something? If that's all you're doing is reading about the Bible and you're never reading the Bible, you're missing it. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. You want to hear God speak to you? People are always wondering, boy, if I could hear a voice from heaven. I, I was watching this documentary this other day about this nutty lady from Utah and uh, ended up killing her kids. And it was a terrible, terrible thing. And they were playing her, you know, excerpts of her phone conversations with people. And I don't know how many times I heard her say, the Lord said to me, the Lord said to me, but none of it lined up with Scripture. The reality is, is the way you know what God is saying to you, the way you hear from God is this book. Read the Bible. And you need to be back on that. By the way, we are going to start doing that together as a congregation. We've done that in the past, starting on Thanksgiving Day. That's the day we're starting our new Bible reading plan. Thanksgiving Day. That's a weird day to start something new in a church, right? But it's not if you think about it. The essence of thanksgiving is giving thanks, give, th thanking God for the blessings that he's given us. Well, how do you know what the blessings are that God has given to you? Well, you know, we all know the immediate, the ones that come to our mind. I'm alive. I've got food. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I, I've, I've, I've got friends. I've got family. Those are the immediate blessings. The deeper, more important spiritual blessings, you know because you understand the book. And so we're going to start that on Thanksgiving Day, a Bible reading plan attached to the preaching and all of those kind of things. We'll tell you more about that. Read your Bible. There's a second thing you need to do. Not only do you need to read the Bible, you need to think about the Bible. Have you ever thought about how much time we spend thinking about things that aren't worth thinking about? That's a great sentence. That is a sentence that only can come to you with enough drugs in your system, all right? 
we spend a lot of time thinking about things that aren't really that important. We spend a lot of time thinking about things that we have no control over. Fill your mind with the word of God. Uh, all this past year, we've heard this, this thing said a lot, okay? Fake news, fake news, fake news. Let me tell you what, the fake news is not new. Satan's been spreading fake news since the beginning of time. He loves telling you lies. He loves filling your mind with junk. How do you know what the world is real? How do you know what's really going on around you? Think, read the Bible, then think about it. How does this apply? How am I supposed to live this out in my daily life? How do I see this passage being reflected in my world today? Read the Bible. Think about the Bible. Here's a, another thing. Talk to others about the Bible. Now, I'm not talking just about witnessing here. That's important. But you know one of the, one of the most edifying things that you can do? is if you get a group of other people who are reading the Bible on the same schedule that you are, and you get together and you begin to say to them, you know, as I was reading that passage this week, I began to think about how this works out in my life, and these are some adjustments that I'm making. And then someone else that's in your group says, you know what, I've been thinking about that same thing, and this is how God is kind of dealing with me on my heart. You know what begins to happen? You learn from each other you encourage one another, and then you are able to hold each other accountable for that. It's a novel thing, but you know what the early church did a lot of? Making house to house, talking about the Scripture. And how do I know they were talking about the Scripture? Their worship services are described very different than ours. Did you ever notice that Paul says, if anyone comes with a word... They're supposed to share with one another. They're supposed to be talking to one another. They're supposed to be telling. In other words, if you show up and you've got something, I say this a lot, our spiritual lives are determined by the overflow in our life. You know what I mean? The overflow, as, as we're reading and we're taking in and we're praying, what begins to happen is God begins to fill up. It's like a stream inside of us. And when that, when that reservoir is full, it begins to wash over and spill out into other people's lives. That's how we minister. Well, that channel is opened up as we read, think about, and talk about the Bible. And then we pray the Bible. You want to improve your prayer life? Start basing your prayers around Scripture. Think about this. This is, this is so simple. God says he will answer any of our prayers that are within the, his will. Amen? Does he say that? I'll answer any prayer that's within your will. How do we know what's in his will? Oh, he told us. So if we take these, the, if we take some of the prayers that are right here, you read through 2 Chronicles. They're filled with prayers that the, that, that the kings prayed. Pray those back to God. Take the passages like in Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul is laying out a prayer for the Ephesians and just use that as a guideline to pray for your family. I promise you, I promise you, God will start answering. It's all word-based. It's all built around the word of God. There's a third thing we need to do. Not only must we get rid of idols and set our minds on obeying the Lord, we also have to revive true worship. You'll notice something that as you go through here, that uh, um, they're constantly renewing the, um, the worship. Probably the most famous example of that would be Joash and Hezekiah later on in, the, in, in these books. They go back and they begin to look and they begin to realize something. Very often we like to get real innovative in our worship. Humans like to touch things. We like to put our stamp of approval on stuff. We like to make it fit the way we want it to work. Now in the Old Testament, I need to say this to you. There are, in the Old Testament worship, there was no creativity allowed in messing with the order. 
There was creativity in, you know, writing the psalm and doing those kind of things. But the order of how things were to be done was set in stone. God said, this is what you do. Do this, do this, do this, do this. If you read the book of Numbers, you find out there were certain things they had to do every day, certain things they had to do once a week, certain things they had to do every several months, certain things they had to do at different times in the year. They had a, a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly calendar that set their worship in stone. The New Testament, we're a little bit more free. We're giving a look, but there are certain elements that should always be in our worship. Now, what happens is very often our intent in worship gets on to the wrong things. Let me, let me say this to you very, very simply. New Testament worship is not about you. The test of New Testament worship is not, do you feel better when you leave? The test of New Testament worship is not whether you enjoy what happened. In fact, New Testament worship has very little to do with you. It all is focused on God. Now, here's the kick. When we put our focus and our attention on God, he generally speaks to us. Does he always say things that we want to hear? Do, do your parents always tell you things you want to hear? No. If they do, they're not very good parents. Sometimes they have to tell you things like, no, Max, you can't have that cupcake. No, you can't do this. Sometimes God has to correct us. But if our intent is merely human, all we will ever have, all we'll ever experience is what human ingenuity and human energy can create. If you want to experience God, you have to get focused on him. You have to get focused on who am I worshiping? He's the object of our worship. We need to get our minds and our hearts out of this world onto him, all right? Because what will happen? That's how he transforms us. That's how he changes us. Not only that, it must be guided by the Scripture. Guided by the Scripture. We should sing songs based in Scripture. We should, we should read Scripture together. We, that's things we did this morning. Can we all agree with that? Very biblical worship. We came and we gathered and we sang about the Scripture and we read the Scripture together. We actually even obeyed the Scripture together in calling it and praying over one of our church members. We're continuing that in preaching the Word. We must be guided by the Scripture. We must be centered on the Gospel. A fellow here a while back said to me, Pastor, your problem is you preach the gospel too much. I'll take that criticism every day of my life. That's what we're to be centered on. We have one message. Here's the message. We are dreadfully broken in sin, but God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life and to die in our place on the cross and to rise again so that we can have new life. And anyone, anyone, anyone who will repent of their sin and put their trust in him, he will save them and deliver them. If you read the Bible, the center of the whole scripture is the gospel. You read the Old Testament, it's preparing us for the coming of Jesus. You read the gospels, it's telling us about what Jesus came to do. The, the epistles after in the New Testament, the letters are all there to tell us this is what you do as a result of the gospel. It's all centered and focused on the gospel, the good news that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And he's coming back. And you and I need to have a personal relationship with him. And it is through that message, through that gospel, that we enter into that personal, intimate, dynamic relationship with God. Finally, our worship must be motivated by the mission. People ask, why do we worship? A number of years ago, John Piper wrote a wonderful little book called Let the Nations Be Glad. 
And in there, he went through and, and laid out this idea biblically and went through the scripture in great detail of, of that worship is at the very center of everything we do as human beings. We were created for the purpose of worship. And the reason why we do evangelism, the reason why we do missions, Mackenzie, the, where's Mackenzie? She's doing sound. She's all the way back there waving like a mad woman. Mackenzie is leaving later this year, going to France as a career missionary. Why is she doing that? She's doing that because there are people who do not worship. And the essence of the gospel is inviting them into this new relationship. Because you can't worship God until you know him. And you can't know him until you've been saved. And the only reason way you can be saved is to hear the gospel. And someone must go and tell. Next week, Hadley's going to come and share with us about her ministry. And isn't that awesome? We're talking about the kids that have grown up in our church that are not now going out and doing missions and ministry. She's going to come and talk about special needs ministry and talk about the work that she's doing. Why does she do that? Because every boy, girl, child, man, woman in this world, no matter what their condition, no matter where they came from, no matter what their background, no matter what, their special need, their fundamental need is to know Jesus. So when we gather, our motivation, our motivation is to worship him and to make him known to the world. Amen. When I was at Open Door up there in West Virginia, we had a sign on the door. Very simple sign. As you walked into the sanctuary, it said, enter to worship. And as they were driving, as they were walking out of the sanctuary, it said, exit to serve. I was at a church here not too long ago, and when you were driving, they have this really long driveway. And when you're driving out at the end of the parking lot, right at the end, it says, you are now entering the mission field. You all are missionaries if you're saved. So let me ask you the question. Are there any idols in your life? Tear them down. Have you, are you seeking to serve the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your mind? Are you, are you daily in his word? Are you reading it? Are you talking about it? Are you meditating upon it? Are you living it? And finally, are you really worshiping? When you come here on Sunday morning, is your heart set on God or is your heart set on something else? I'm going to say this to you very bluntly. Generally, we get out of church exactly what we put into it. The more effort and the more desire we have, you know what will happen? Suddenly, you'll be again to experience God. Put these three things in practice. We start seeing revival break out. Personally, corporately, and then we pray that God will spread that across our world. Amen.